لا كتاب بعد كتابه ولا شريعة بعد شريعته ولا صحابة بعد صحابته ولا أهل بيت بعد أهل بيته فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هو إلا وحي يوحى وما ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى فقال النبي العربي الهاشمي عليه أفضل الصلوات وأكمل التحيات وأسكى المباركات ما أنا بقارئ صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين رمضان مبارك to everyone uh, hopefully إن شاء الله may Allah bring a lot of joy and beauty to everyone's life and baraka um, and تفتح أبواب السماوات وأبواب الخير عليكم وعلينا إن شاء الله um, just very quickly I wanted to mention um, some points about the idea and the nature of wahi um, in the 13th century, rather in the 11th century, there was a Muslim king uh, who uh, sort of had this discourse about the wahi of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And uh, for those of us as Muslims today, 14 centuries later, um, we carry a memory of the Holy Prophet um, alayhi salatu wasalam. And this memory of the Prophet sort of stands because of the singular nature of wahi. Wahi in Arabic, obviously we know as revelation. Allah says in Surah Najm, وَمَا يَنْدِقَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِي يُوحَىٰ That the Holy Prophet does not speak except through revelation. And this idea of revelation is so, so crucial because that's what separates us from every other millah, from every other nation, from every other religion, uh, religious or otherwise. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the Qur'an with أَلَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ that those people who bring belief into the unseen, what is this nature of the unseen, right? Why do we believe in the unseen and how does it structure our life? This is the idea of wahi, right? That the Holy Prophet is someone who is, has some knowledge of wahi. He is able to sort of uh, communicate through Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the angels through, through this institution of wahi. And all of Islam, all branches of Islam, all of Islamic history, uh, is marked by the singular concept of wahi or revelation. Now what does it mean to carry wahi? What does it mean to have revelation? <coughs> what does it mean to receive revelation? Um, for those of us you know, who have been attending masjid lectures since we were young, we've heard terms like qalb, ruh, nafs, all of this stuff. What does it all mean, the fitra? Um, and uh, the great scholar of Hindustan, Shawulillah Muhammad Dahlawi, talks about what is this reality of wahi? How is the Prophet receiving revelation? Why does the Prophet receive revelation? And what is going on vis-a-vis -vis his qalb, vis-a-vis -vis his heart, uh, his ruh, his soul, his nafs, which is his self, and his fitra or his nature? How do all of these come together in this relationship of wahi or revelation? When revelation comes into the Prophet, what is happening? biologically, chemically, and most importantly, metaphysically, alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, I think about uh, the fact that Imam Bukhari, in his Sahih al-Bukhari al-Jami' al-Musnad, he starts off the first chapter. Does anybody know the first chapter of Bukhari? The title head. كَيْفَ كَانَ بَدْءُ الْوَحِي مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ How is, what, what is the nature? Literally, كَيْفَ يعني what is the nature of, of the beginning of wahi upon the Holy Prophet? So all of our Islamic civilization starts with this beginning. This is the beginning of us, of us as lives, as hayat, of, 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 of hayatu millatina, of the life of our nation, begins with this act of wahi. Um, the Holy Prophet والسلام, in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, narrated by our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wa aradaha, mentions the story of wahi. Um, we know that the Prophet would go to the cave of Hira, Right? And he would contemplate and he would reflect. Many of the scholars, they say that why did he do this? Why, why was the Prophet sitting alone in a cave? And why did Allah will this to happen for the Prophet to sit alone in a cave and reflect and contemplate? Uh, scholars like Ibn Hazm and Alam Shibil Uthmani, rahimahumullah, they mention that one of the reasons of contemplation or uzla or solitude, people don't know how to be alone anymore. Right? People can't be alone for more than a couple of minutes. But this idea of why was the Holy Prophet coming and sitting in a cave alone. Imam al-Ghazali in his Ihya ul Madin has a whole chapter called Kitab al-Uzla, being alone, khalwat. Right, this idea of being alone. Um, and the, the scholars, they mentioned that why was the Holy Prophet sitting alone in a cave, right? And those who have been to Mecca, they have, you know, 
uh, climb that long mount, uh, you know, the, the, the towering mountain of, of Hira. And they mention that the reason why is so that when someone sits alone, there is the wajjuh and hudur of the heart. There is attention and presence of the heart. That your heart comes alive when you separate from people. Right? This is this idea of concentration. When we talk about mindfulness, people talk about mindfulness but don't really understand that what is our mind full of? Our mind is full of so many things and we lack that hudur and that tawajjuh. Right? That presence. Hudur means presence. Right? And tawajjuh and that attention. Right? That sort of... Um, cosmic attention that can happen with our hearts. So the Prophet is literally priming himself for revelation, although unknowingly, alayhi salatu wasalam, he is literally priming himself for revelation, right? Because in order to carry it, to carry wahi is a, is, is a very heavy thing. It's thakhil, right? Um, and uh, there, there are many different narrations, but anyways, uh, one of these times that the Holy Prophet is, is choosing solitude, alayhi salatu wasalam, in Hira, Jibreel alayhi salam comes. All the scholars mentioned this happened in Ramadan. And th there's a reason for this, and I'll tell you later. Is that, and as Jibreel alayhi salam comes, the Prophet sees him. Now, this is really important because there are angels all around us. Allah says in Surah, There are angels in front of us and behind us. Right? But none of us can see it. Right? Because in order to see it, you have to, ha you have to be of a certain spiritual capacity. Right? Even Sayyidina Abu Bakr عنه, could not see the angels, even though of his, despite the fact that he's the greatest non-prophet. Right? He is, they say, خَلُّ الْخَلْقِ بَعْدَ الرُّسُلِ Sayyidina Abu Bakr is the greatest human after all of the prophets. So, uh, the prophet has, is, has now sort of reached a certain spiritual level where he is able to now see Sayyidina Jibreel And he sees Sayyidina Jibreel. He says, in another hadith in Bukhari, the Holy Prophet says that he only saw Jibreel twice. Once here, and once when he reached at Sidratul Muntaha, when he did Isra al-Mi'raj. And so he sees Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, and we know the story that Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam hugs the Holy Prophet. In fact, Taghashahu, he hugs him closely. Again, what is the purpose of this? Uh, many of the scholars say that this is the spiritual transference of energy. Again, elevating the Prophet's spiritual station, alayhi salam, to make him ready for wahi. Right? Um, as the hadith of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha tells us that sometimes the Prophet would be sitting on her, his knee would be on her knee, and wahi would come, and she said that she could feel a tremendous weight on her own leg, right? And what that means is that there's a certain sort of, uh, you know, current, right? A spiritual current that is now flowing into the Prophet, right? That means his qalb, his ruh, his fitrah, all of that is expanding now to receive revelation, um, you know? And the, the ayah in Surah Muzammil, right? The qawlan thaqila. Allah says this is a heavy word, right? This has a this has a this has a cosmic impact on individuals, right? And this idea of the Quran being having a lot of weight, right? The idea of the Quran holding so much weight, right? Where the Holy Prophet said that sometimes I would receive revelation, and it was like salatul jaras. It was like the ringing of bells. And as we know, with bells, there's a certain wavelength that is produced when you when you when you ring a bell. Right? And so this is sort of what's happening, right? Wavelength is being disrupted. The sound frequency is being disrupted. The Prophet said that he could sort of see a variation of color schemes when he would receive revelation because he's, he's literally transcending worlds, right? He's crossing worlds. Allah says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allah is the Lord of all of the worlds, right? So, so to connect all of these universes, that to be a Muslim, to be a Muslim is to occupy multiple worlds and multiple universes at the same time. This is this idea that scholars call tawajud, that you have wujud, you have existence in multiple worlds at the same time. That's why the Prophet said, as salatu mi'rajul mu'min. The prayer is the ascension of the believer. He is literally crossing time and space. This is the idea of ibadah, right? You are literally crossing time and space, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so for the, for the Holy Prophet to receive all of this revelation, right? So then when Sayyidina Jibila alayhi salam hugs him, right? Or rather engulfs him, Right? There is this connection, right, that is now established between him and the rest of the Ummah up until Qiyamah. And in fact, we say this the Prophet is not just our Prophet in this world, our Prophet is our Prophet in Barzakh, and he's also our Prophet in the afterlife too. He will also be Rasulullah there. He will also be Khatam al Nabiyyin there, alayhi salatu was salam. And it's always important to sort of remember that, right? Because Islam starts and ends with the Prophet. We don't have the Quran except through the tongue of the Prophet. لا تحرك لسانك لتعجل به. Right, so all of this is based on this act of wahi. 
all of us as Muslims can only claim to be Muslim, can only self-refer as Muslims, only if we reckon with this idea of wahi, right? This idea of revelation that is world-changing, world-transforming, right? And that as all of our sciences of Islam emerges from the singular act um, of revelation. And this is what non-Muslims, you know, whether they're Orientalist or otherwise, do not understand about Islam. Is that what do we mean when we say wahid? What, what do we mean when we talk about the unseen? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. You know, this is, this, is, this is an incredible critique of all other systems, right? This idea that we have a sophisticated idea and a hierarchy of the unseen, right? Everything else is speculation, but this in the Qur'an, no other religion has this, right? This idea that you have the afterlife, you have the pre-eternal life, you have these angels, you have the jinns, you have resurrection, etc., etc., you know. Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, none of these religions have this, right? And so this idea um, that as Muslims, you know, in the, in the modern Western academy, they always talk about how do we know something is true? The idea of knowledge, right? So they say that you can only touch it, see it, feel it, hear it, right? Smell it, the five senses. But in Islam, this idea of the ghayb transcends all of, all of these five, right? And it's, 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 it's validating the fact that, look, hey, you do have these five senses, but there is, a, there is a sixth and a seventh sense, right? And this is the access into the unseen that happens through wahi, right? That happens through revelation, right? And, and we know that this revelation is true, and you know, as Mufti Wasim is sort of talking about the miracles of the Qur'an, right? And so, as Muslims, if we can sort of uh, really root ourselves in the institution of wahi, that what did the Holy Prophet come to bring, right? And, and how is it transforming and changing not just our lives, and not just this world, but all of the worlds, right? Alameen. And, and, and all of the Muslim scholars understood this, right? That the Qur'an is a revelation not just for human beings, right? But for jinns as well, right? And, for, and, and, and in fact, we can say all of nature. And if that is the case, then what are we doing to make sure that we are translating the values of the Qur'an to the universe, right? You know, in, in Surah Jinn, Allah says, quoting the jinns, inna sama we have, heard, we, have, we have heard a wonderful recitation. And, and then after that, we have never heard anything like this. Right? And so, uh, for, even for the jinns, right? This idea of wahi was very singular to them. They had never heard anything like this. The great poet Muhammad Iqbal says, That the, the heavens have never seen such a sight. That even the heart of Jibreel alayhi salam trembles at the sight of this. That what a wonderful civilization that has been built here. That the believer worships, that the believer understands wahi, and the non-Muslim doesn't. Right? And this is the secret, right? really, of Islamic civilization. And this is something that we can offer that no other civilization can in this institution of wahi, which is a system you know, that affects social life, political life, anthropological life, theological life, artistic life. All of this is bound up with wahi, with that one act of when the Prophet is in Hira, in, in, in the cave of Hira, Hira alayhi salatu wasalam. And the scholars, they mention that when the Prophet receives revelation, um, he says these words that, ma ana biqari, that I am not a reader. Right? Because in Arabic, the word qara'a, people uh, think it means to recite, but the original meaning in jahiliyyah meant to gather. Qara'a, a Qur'an, literally meant a gathering. It was a jama'ah. Many of the scholars of Lugha mentioned this. It's, it's a gathering, right? What is it gathering? It's gathering the values of wahi, right? Together in one singular message, in one singular risala. And so for us as Muslims to understand what the Prophet went through in those moments, right? as he sort of transcends time and space to receive revelation and then translate that for us. Right? Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ That the Prophet does, he explains the ayat, these signs, right? These cosmic signs. This is wahi. Right? That the Prophet is translating wahi into a language that is intelligible, that is legible to you and I. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And that is the most crucial aspect to remember as Muslims that the Qur'an begins and ends with wahi, right? And Islam itself too is this idea that through a prophet, through a chosen individual who has access to the unseen, 
then gives us that knowledge for us to live as people who are khulafa, who are trustees on this world and in the next life. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa sanadina wa rasulina Muhammad wa barik wa sallam. Just some words and inshallah we'll continue tomorrow. Jazakallah khair.